Hey everyone, today I'm going to be talking about how to build a Twitter clone. I'm going to be going into all the details of deploying it, um, dealing with cloud providers like AWS or DigitalOcean or Azure, um, some stuff on Docker, some stuff on Nginx, some stuff on Flask, making calls to backend APIs from JavaScript, all this sort of stuff. All right, so here I have this site, siteclones.freeddns.org, and I have two site clones available, uh, pastebin clone and Twitter clone. So I'm going to be talking about the Twitter clone. This is what the site looks like. It's heavily inspired by the Flask Mega tutorial, this thing. Miguel Grinberg, great tutorial if you want to learn Flask. So, so at the site you can make a post. Hello, how's it going, everyone? And you can like search for stuff. All right. So. Regarding the design of the site, there's a client, they hit the web server. From the web server, rather, let me let me just call this for now the app server, and I will elaborate on this part. Um, so, obviously I need a database to store all this stuff. So we got our app db and uh, now how am I powering the search so one way to do the search would be to query the database um, so imagine you have some post table all right So you got some post table like ID user ID body. Let's call this the body. All right. You might have other stuff about the post like create date created. Let's say this was created March 29, 2021. All right, and one, two, three, four, five, and we got like, I like Python. How is it going? What's your name? I like Rust. I like Django. All right, anyway. So you got all this stuff, user ID, let's say it's like one, 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 two, two. And someone searches for Python. So you can just select all of the posts where they contain Python, which would just be this one. Um, an alternative way would be to use Elasticsearch, for example, which is what I did. So it builds an index. Now, I realize the viewers may not be familiar with what Elasticsearch is, so I had a few things to say about this. So many terminals. Um, this is the one. This is the one. All right, I realize this looks like a mess, but let me copy this and show you. And yes, I do have a lot of notepads open. All right, so let me not word wrap actually. So you can like, now I have Elasticsearch running on port 9200. 9, now with Elasticsearch, you build an index. So I'm gonna build an index for the posts, post. Why does it show this error? This is not what I wanted to see. Ah, this last one is good. 
What did I actually search for to get this? Oh, I did a slash search. I see. So this is this is the this is the curl request that I did. Uh, and it gave this response. Let's wrap it now. So it was successful. Um, it had four hits because I didn't uh, I didn't filter it. You can apply like multi-match filters on on the body. This is the body, and um, so you can like search for the keyword Python, and it would return just this one, just the one post. Even though I realized that there are a bunch of posts, but only one of them has the word Python. So anyway, this is kind of the idea behind Elasticsearch. Now, what happens is whenever someone makes a post, hey, it's me, Mario, um, it's going to add it to the index. I mean, there's code for this. Let me show. Trying to remember where I put this. After commit. All right, so after they have committed their transaction to the database, it adds it to the index. What does this do? By the way, I like this feature on GitHub. This uh, you can like jump to it. They never used to have this. So you can define some searchable fields. For now, my only searchable field will be body. And uh, so for all of the searchable fields, I get the the content, like what is this field? So for example, I like Python. So it adds it to the, anyway, it adds it here and then it adds it to the index, which is adding this to the post index, which is basically adding it to this. All right, so we have the app server and we have Elasticsearch. By the way, other things with Elasticsearch, this thing is typically designed for large tasks with like a lot of like searching like a cluster, like like lots of memory involved, lots of data. It is designed for this. But I, I mean, I have just a little site and I only have a little server with not so much memory. And when I tried to run Elasticsearch, it just, hated me. It was like, you have run out of Java virtual memory. So you may need to get around this by doing something like, this took me like an hour to figure out, like, how do I stop this thing from happening? Um, always fun. So in fact, you can do something like this. Java option, Elasticsearch, Java options, and like do a set that the max and min memory is 128 megabytes, then it won't use all your memory. And then when you look, how much memory is this whole thing using? Um, why are there so many? Uh, you can do like a Docker stats. Does that, maybe I'm misremembering. So, I guess all of them have a, wow, this is going to give me some like, it's like flashing. But anyway, the Twitter search has a memory usage of like 300 megabytes or, I don't know. I limited this. If I did not limit this, it was going to use like all my memory. All right. Anyway. So this is, this is Elasticsearch. And uh, so this is, this is the basic design. Now, I suppose, you know, the static content, how should I, how should I even, I don't even know how to draw this, but like, when they're hitting the server, the web, now let's call it a web server, some of the content is like static content, like bootstrap 
or something. Now this is inside of a CDN, a content delivery network. You have all these edge nodes around the world and some root node, I don't know, somewhere in the US. Anyway, so I guess the web server will get some of the stuff from a CDN and send it back to you. And it will get some other stuff from a uh, from the app server. Maybe I'll delete this arrow. No, I don't want that one. I want the rectangular box. All right, app server. Wait, I I should have called this lost search. What am I What am I even doing? All right. So. You know what? This is all fine. Let me just, uh, my camera is getting in, in the way of this. All right, so. Is this, is this accurate? I guess technically this thing talks back to the web server and the web server sends you your whatever you want to know back and forth and then back to you which I guess is also the case with this one eh, whatever Anyway, anyway, um, so this is the kind of thing. Now here, because my web server is Flask and I'm rendering, well, okay. So with Flask, you have like the model view controller design. So the models are like your database tables, which in this case is like a user table and a post table. And because there is like following, like followers or following, um, you also have to design this somehow. Um, but anyway, anyway, um, So those are the models, the database tables. And the views are like your templates, like this is what the user sees. This is like the home page. So you see this top bar, API docs. You got API docs. All right. And um, so anyway. Uh, the way that you render these things with Flask is like in the app, in the main, in the routes. We have an index route and we render the template. So it uses like Jinja to substitute some variables like the posts into this HTML and then it has to return the HTML. So although you see, here you'll see like, where is it? Hello world. In fact, um, in the, I mean this is dynamic, this will change. But in the template, it doesn't look like that. In the template, it's going to look like oh, I, I had a post one. Well, it's going to look like the user said something, 
and then post.body, which is a variable that we need to substitute, and this is called the mustache syntax, all sorts of fancy things. Anyway, now suppose you're a you're a React fanboy or a Vue person, and you want to build this web server with. Like you wanna, you wanna have a super interactive website that you build with React, and then you wanna like call Flask to get the data, cause you know, like you're not gonna, you're not gonna connect to a database with React, like that's, that's not what it's for. So you're, you're gonna do that with Flask or something. So you're gonna call from your React app, you're gonna call Flask, and you're gonna be like, hey Flask, I wanna know what posts this user made and then Flask is going to be like alright let me check the database and then it's going to send back the data and then it's going and then React is going to be like oh great now and then it's going to render the data on the site um, now if if though you were getting this data on this user like like all the time you might want to cache this so you might even have like a redis I know there's memcached or redis but like let's just say redis and uh, so when they get this user, you're gonna you're gonna look at the Redis cache instead of the database, and then you don't even need to go to the database, and it's just like gonna be much less load on your servers. It's gonna return it super fast, so you might want to cache this. But then you know to power the cache, that's gonna require that's like an in-memory key value store. That's gonna require some memory, some consideration. You know, my server only has like a few gigs of memory. What am I gonna do? But um, but anyway, I guess I'll show since I added this component and I didn't show. I also did not show how to do the database. So let me let me show both of these. And I also didn't even show the CDN or the web server. All right, I got to show how to do some of this stuff. All right, let's start with the basics. Let's say we wanted to call Flask from our JavaScript web server. Number one. Um, so I have some. I prepared some code for this. Here it is. Um, welcome to my site. And then uh, in the site, it it have some JavaScript code where it's going to call my Flask API, which is running on port 5000, and it's going to send a request to get some stuff, and then you're going to like that's going to call Flask. And then Flask is going to return something, and then I'm just going to like console log the response. All right, so bang, inspect. These are the developer tools. Everybody knows this, I hope. And look at that. This was my request, and this was my response, and there I logged it. Amazing. Um. I mean, I guess if you like Vue, you're probably used to Axios. I hope I pronounced that right. There's also the fetch. People like to use fetch, but I mean, this is super. This is this this also works. Um, but it, I mean, if you would try to do this, so I'll show I'll show what code I have for my Flask thing. Um, This is all the code. You might be like, wow, this is it? Yeah, this is it. This is everything I have for the for the Flask API that's that's running in the back end. So let me get rid of this course thing. I didn't end up doing that. Um, so you have some database connection. Great. And um, so this this after request thing is just a workaround because um, JavaScript is fussy and it doesn't like it when you don't have that when you don't have this 
uh, access allow origin header in your response. If you don't have this, it doesn't like you. Um, so you load the config, you connect to the database, and um, and then I have some database. This is like an ORM ob object relation model. <laughs> Sorry about that. Let me look up if I pronounce that right. ORM object relation mapping. My bad. Um, so I mean the user table. You would have something like the ID the username, the password hash, all sorts of stuff. And then you would have a post class. Excuse my keyboard, it's kind of loud. Um, anyway, you have this post class. And, uh, and you would need to create these tables, but actually, you don't need to. Well, I mean... Sorry, when I say to create the tables, you need to do, don't we all love SQL, so we need to do create table users ID integer primary key dot 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 or do we where's the image? Ah uh, I can't find it. Or do we? Someone will get it. Anyway, so um, so you, you can create this, but but uh, so I assume people know how to do this. Should I show it? You know what? Let's show it. SQL 101. SQLite. Browse. old school let's call this app dot um, old dot db so if you're old school let's connect now I've just so that's literally it for SQLite I mean you want to make an SQLite database you saw me I just did it I made a file I have a database you create table use you want to create a table create table users um, ID integer primary key Username, string, password, string, password hash, string, who stores passwords. That's so old school. Um, and then you insert into users the um, username, password hash. String worked. Maybe I did, I didn't think that works. I thought you have to do like text or something, or var car. Uh, maybe they've they let you do fancy stuff now. Username Nathan password. Hey. Password hash. My bad. Select star from users. All right, we got it. But um, but you actually don't need to to do any of this because you can actually create the table with Flask. So with Flask migrate, too many too many files. So you can do flat from Flask migrate import migrate. You have your database file. Um, you initialize your migrate. So now, when I now if I run this Python script, um, I've loaded. I've I, every time I run the script, it like creates a database connection. And um, so if I run it with like the Pyth flask migrate command, it's not going to run the server, but it's going to run this migrate code. So, uh, let me show that. So, okay, so first things first. When you do migrate, it's going to create this alembic version table. Let's just say it's not there right now. Maybe I've mispronounced that. Let me kill my API. So I can do like a class db init. So it, it's going to 
create that tape alembic. Oh gosh, I already have this tape. Messed up. Explorer dot handy trick if you want to open the current folder in Windows CMD. Anyway, Flask DB in it. Flask DB migrate dot gen. Initial migrate. And Flask DB upgrade. All right. So, what have we done with these three? This is like the three commands you need to remember when you're doing Flask migrations. So, there we've created this this version table. So if I want to like add a new user column later on, whatever, I can do it. And there I've created this table. Now, what columns does my table actually want? Because like these three columns is probably not enough. So if I show What did I actually do? Username, email, password, hash, all the posts related to this user, which is just a back ref. So it's like in the post table, you have a, um, actually, the way you would do this is like the post table, you just have like a foreign key, like the user ID. And then you have like about me, which is like a one dis line description about the user, or rather like a 140 character description. And then last scene, um, which I guess, how do we do that? Maybe when they log in, probably when they log in, we update that. And who they are following, which is probably also a, a back ref. Yeah, and who, who their followers and follow followed? Oh, I see. This. So the followers is like um, this relationship between the follower and the followed. Um, and then uh, messages that they've sent and received, which I don't think I implemented this. Did I? Can I message people? Maybe. Maybe I did do this. Been a, it's been a while. Hi, Thor got a thunder. Send private message. Hey, Nathan. Yeah, I don't think I implemented this. But anyway, that's okay. That's okay. So, but anyway, you could you could message them, and then uh, I guess probably what you need to do is have like a little pop-up box in the top right, and it would be like, hey, you got a message. So anyway, this this can be done. Um, so what did I talk about? I showed how to do the database. I showed how to do the Flask migrate. Earlier, I showed the Elastic Search. I showed the web server. You can either do Flask or you can do some sort of JavaScript thing which calls Flask. I didn't show Redis. Okay, so for the CDN, what I mean there is I ha I'm using Bootstrap, and um, there we go. I am including. I am including the Bootstrap CSS file from some CDN. You can do this with all your static content. It will be able to uh, fetch it faster. All right. Um, it's like a prox. It doesn't have to travel as far, right? Okay. Um, so I showed the CDN. Um, okay. So for like Nginx here, and I guess I didn't really talk about Docker. Perhaps I showed some stuff about. Okay, so for Docker, um, these are all the processes I have running in Docker containers. So I have like Twitter search, which is like Elastic Search, and I have Twitter app, and I have 
the nginx. So what? Okay, so I'm gonna focus on this nginx thing. Um, so where is my nginx config? It is over here, and it looks like this. And uh, so all the traffic, which is going to slash Twitter clone. Uh, gets uh, forwarded to port to this machine. I guess like the same server, um, but it, you could pass it to any server, you know. Um, and then port 5000. And if it's going to paste bin clone, it goes to the same server, port 5001. So you know, with nginx, you can even do like HTTPS. You could uh, you can do that right in this config here. How would you do that? Well, you would need some like certificate authority, like Let's Encrypt. What is Let's Encrypt, by the way? Let me show you. Let's Encrypt. They have some. Eh, this is gonna be too too long for this video. So this exists, and um, you can use like some cert bot to get a certificate. Once you have the certificate. Um, there's like two parts to the certificate. There's like the PEM file and um, and a key. And it, maybe it's like a .pem and a .crt or something. And then you just uh, you set this all up in, in this nginx config. Alright, so but anyway, you can do load balancing here too. You can have server groups and uh, and then assign some weights to the different servers. Like, oh, I want to send two thirds of my traffic to this server and one third to another server. You can do all that with nginx, or with like DigitalOcean or whatever cloud provider. You can use their load balancer. So anyway. So with the load balancer, before it hits the web server, it's going to hit a load balancer, right? And then in your DNS entry, you're going to like, eh, you're going to do the load balancer. My font is too small. Oh, can I can I bring this back? Ah, there we go. All right, all of this is possible. So I guess it's more like the load balancer hits the web server. All right. Um, now I didn't show Redis, so if you wanna if you wanna do Redis, um, this applies to like the Flask servers. If you, your Flask wants to avoid hitting the database and it wants to hit Redis instead, let me show. So. I'm on my server, my DigitalOcean server, which, by the way, you can create from this droplets menu. Create droplet. It's like an EC2. And then I'm going to connect to this one, which I already did. So, somewhere. I guess all developers are used to having tons of terminals open. And, uh, and then I'm going to do like a Docker run like this. I think the port is 6379. So it's going to pull it from Docker Hub. And you can actually push your own images to Docker Hub. By the way, if you have a lot of images like I do here and you want to deploy them, you can make like a... Uh, a Docker Compose, which perhaps I have. And you define all your services, like I have my Elasticsearch service, I have my Flask app service, I have my React app or whatever. Um, I have my Nginx. You have your Redis, you define it here. You do like a Docker Compose app and you're good. Like, like when I mean Docker Compose app, I literally just mean like on this server it has Docker installed. By the way, you can install Docker with like Snap or apt-get, whatever. So you do Docker Compose app. 
All right. I don't really want to do this because it might actually restart some stuff. Because it's like if it finds anything newer, we'll just like it will restart it, perhaps. Um. So anyway, anyway. So the Redis. I started Redis. So if I look do Docker PS. Redis is up about a minute. Now, Redis has a CLI. So if you want to use the CLI, you can do it with the Docker exec interactive Redis. Um, bin bash Redis CLI keys. 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 Am I missing something? There are no keys. Well, yeah, you know, I'm not super good with this Redis CLI, but um, you can do it all. But why would you? Because there's like a Python package for this, which is easier to use. So let's just do that. So I'm going to Python, uh, Python, import Redis. Do I have Redis installed? I don't. Hit pre install Redis. I noticed there's all these new Python things like poetry and stuff now, and not everyone uses pip, but you know, I love pip. So import redis, r is equal to redis dot redis, and you would specify like the host and the port, but like whatever. So you imagine from your Flask app, you're going to be like inside of one of your endpoints, or probably not inside of one of your endpoints, but like you probably have some global variable which has the just like I had a global veneric like you keep the database connection open you should keep the redis connection open it'll have like a connection pool Java they have something called Jetis for this but Python there's the redis package and then you can do r.keys there are no keys but if I want to set a key I don't know let's say the thing I wanted to cache is like I don't know, what do I want to cache? Some image. Like my home image. I don't know. You can cache it. Path to image. I guess that's not super good. I don't know. You can have any key. You can have like, imagine someone was doing some like search suggestions and you know like the top five suggestions are like why are you doing this? All right. Anyway, so Redis just the key value store. You got to be creative how you how you store the data, but that's what it is, and it's all in memory. So actually, if I stop my Redis. start my redis. Maybe this is not actually a good example. If I remove my redis and now I rerun my redis, which I realize it doesn't remember how to do this. There we go. And now I reconnect to it. What will be my keys? Actually nothing because it emptied it because the memory got cleared. So you got to, this is how it works. OK, so we talked about the Redis and the DB and the Elasticsearch and the load balancer, which I guess I didn't really show. Maybe I'll show quickly. Nginx load balancer config. Oh, gosh, I don't want the pricing. I just want to know. Yeah, this thing. Upstream server and weights. This is basically what it looks like. So, and then you proxy pass to this upstream. That's it. All right, so I showed this. And uh, yeah, so that's how, so, you, so if you were doing load balancing, you could have like, I mean, you could have a load balancer here in front of the app server, and then you would have like a bunch of app servers. So, all 
All right. So what else should I discuss? Um, maybe I maybe I kind of covered the whole thing about the design. So to summarize. You go here, and the search is some elastic search. When they make a new post, it indexes the elastic search. When they search, it queries the elastic search with some multi-match thing. To do the authentication, um, so each user can get a can get a their own token, which expires after some amount of time. Um, so this is how they get their token. They use this API and they do like a curl username, password, and they're like, hey, it's me, Mario. And then it gives them a token. I'm like, all right, Mario, here's a token for you. Please use this for the next few days or hours. And then whenever they make, it's like a JSON web token, JWT. So whenever they want to do a new request, they gotta, they gotta pass this bare header. And then they can use all these API things. I exposed the API, but this is actually the same requests that are being called when you click on various things on the site. So what sort of API things do we have? We got like something to get all the users, something to get who's following who. I guess I just exposed the, the user's API. I didn't expose the post's API. But you know, you also need some post things so that people can, um, can write a post. I guess when it returns the information about the user, it gives all the posts. Anyway, um, so yeah, you you got some sort of searching, and then yeah, when they do a when they do a when they say something, say something, I'm digging up on you, and they submit. This is going to um, it's going to send like a post request. It's like a 200 response, I guess. Anyway, or like 201, like it created something. And, uh, yeah, no, you know, if they can't log in, you're going to send like a 403 forbidden, something like this. So when you go to a different, end, when you go to a different index, it's like a different endpoint, right? So now you got the user endpoint. When you go home, this is like the index endpoint. When you go to explore, so when we're doing this explore, we have to query all the users and maybe we're going to do some top top 10 users and we're going to do some pagination here so it's going to query the database and then when they do the next ones we're going to get like filter the results from like let's get results 11 to 20 and something so you know you don't need to consume all the bandwidth if you have like a million rows you just get the first 10 and then the next 10 and then and maybe they could filter these somehow um, and we went through the database. I guess I didn't show what the pastes, what, what, what the posts look like. Um, once again, model, view, controller. Models are the database models. View the web view and the controller the routes I guess maybe you could consider the form to be part of the view as well and the form links to the controller it's like when they post well I, I guess I never did show what the how that form works I guess this is not the time or place for that but so they have this Flask WFTF thing, WT forms. Um, and 
anyway. So, uh, you know, when they, well, so you have some validators on some of these fields, and when they submit, it will, uh, I guess this this isn't the one with the form. Let me try to find that. Edit profile. All right, yeah. So here you have a form. I guess it kind of generates the form code, so it's not super obvious. But anyway, when you submit it, uh, it's going to. Oh, you know you know where that's defined. You know where that's defined is um, in the main routes. So when they, yeah, so I don't know, you create the form and then when they, when they submit, it's going to go back to the same endpoint and it's going to pass in like query parameters of whatever their form data was. And then you're going to do whatever you want to do. Um, so I went through that. Yeah, I think that's I think that's basically everything. So once you once you kind of understand this design, a lot of things are similar, like pastebin, for example. Um, for pastebin, you're going to have your client, you're going to have your web server, you're going to have your apps or app servers. Now the app servers would have to generate some URL when you make a new paste and say like your your paste is live, at like. A B C D E G, pastebin.com slash that. Um, so you need some like you either generate them randomly, but then you can run into conflicts when you have a lot of keys. Or you could like yeah like you generate a you generate some paste URL that someone else already had. So you could use some like key generation service something. Then the paste can expire, so then you're gonna have some background service like. Yeah, up here, background service, which is going to like talk to the database, right? And then you may have to shard your database or whatever. You could even do a serverless thing. But um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. You might have read this. You know, it's all it's all very similar. So. I mean, if you understand how how this is designed, you can build you can build a lot of sites. Like I wanted to build a site for some fantasy, um, some like hockey pool thing. So you can imagine for a hockey pool. Um, once again, you know, people are gonna log into your site. They're gonna choose some players. So you're gonna need some database, which is like, or some player API, and then you need some user API. And uh, it's uh, it's all sort of the same thing. Anyway, I hope this was helpful. I could go into more detail on any of these topics if people wanted, um, like maybe maybe a specific video with more details on Elasticsearch or a specific video with more details on Docker or more details on different databases like Postgres or SQLite or some video going into the load balancing or um, more stuff on Flask. Just, just let me know. All right. Bye then.